Well, good evening, everyone. I think we will now begin our webinar. Welcome. My name is Mark Lazarovic, and I'm the chair of the European Movement uh, in Scotland. Uh, we've got a really uh, exciting uh, uh, and timely event this evening. But before we do that, can I just uh, go through a couple of uh, uh, details of the arrangements uh, for tonight. Um, we have um, several hundred people who have registered for this event, which is good. Uh, though because of that, we will be having to run this in a very uh, organized way. Um, so um, if you are someone who's uh, watching, as opposed to one of the speakers, of course, you, the, uh, you will be on mute uh, during the course of the event. Uh, but obviously, we're keen to have as many questions and discussion as possible. So when we uh, when, when you have a question, particularly uh, obviously after the speakers are finished speaking, um, if you could give your question in the Q&A box on the screen, and then I will select as many questions, a range of questions I can, and pass them on to uh, the speakers. For those of you who aren't used to this particular platform, you will find uh, if you move your um, cursor either down to the bottom, uh, if it's a, um, a laptop or PC, a icon which says Q&A, so you just type your um, question in there. Uh, I understand if you're using a tablet, a similar button is at the top of your screen. So if you please do that, uh, and we will answer as many as we can. Uh, just to say, uh, we are recording uh, this um, presentation tonight, so uh, I want to advise you uh, of that. So. Um, I think that's all the uh, technical arrangements at this stage. Um, as I said, I'm the chair of the European Movement in Scotland, which is Scotland's uh, largest pro-European organisation. And uh, at the end of the seminar, we'll be giving some more information about what we do. And I hope you'll find that um, uh, uh, something which you wish to uh, you wish to take up and uh, perhaps get involved in our activities. Uh, but today, of course, uh, we have a webinar which. Uh, um, given what uh, we thought might have been announced yesterday, but then wasn't announced yesterday about uh, the future relationship between the UK and the EU might have been even more uh, on, on the point, but it's still very important uh, today. And our topic, of course, is um, the EU views of you, EU views of the UK and Scotland uh, post Brexit. And of course, there are many, many questions that come from that. Uh, today's event is being organised by your movement in Scotland, but we are doing that uh, in association, first of all, with the uh, support of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, uh, uh, UK and Northern uh, UK uh, office, uh, and uh, we'll hear a few words from the director of that office shortly. And then we have four um, expert speakers. Uh, I mean, they are really, really expert speakers, and. Uh, Therefore, I will only be giving a short introduction to the speakers or it would take too long to go through their expertise, but those speakers are uh, in the order in which they will be uh, speaking. Giles Merritt, who has been a, who has reported from Brussels and EU affairs since 1978, first uh, with the Financial Times, founding the Friends of Europe in 1999, author of uh, a number of books on the future of, of Europe, um, um, uh, slippery Slope, Europe's Troubled Future, a recent one and earlier, People Power, Why We Need More Migrants and the other works as well. Uh, after Giles, it will be Nicoletta Pirozzi, who is the head of programmes on the EU politics and institutions and institutional relations manager at Istituto Affari Internazionale in Rome and is also an associate uh, uh, at the European University Institute in Florence. After that, we have Nikolai von Ondarza, who is the head of the EU Europe Division at the German Institute for International Security Affairs in Berlin. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Kirsty Hughes, who is the director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations, who is a writer and commentator on Scottish education and UK, Scottish European and UK politics, and has published extensively on. Uh, matters relating to Europe and the Scottish Centre on European Relations is the other uh, co-sponsor of this event, along with the Conrad Adenauer Foundation uh, and, of course, ourselves. And that uh, concludes my uh, uh, opening uh, comments, and I would now like to hand over to Matthias Berger from the uh, Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, Matthias, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Good evening and also a warm welcome on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation to this uh, online Vinent uh, event tonight. Uh, Mark, time is short, so I will be very brief. Uh, just mentioning that this event is uh, the latest result of our cooperation with the Scottish Centre um, on uh, of European Relations and the European Movement at Scotland, a cooperation which has provided a platform for dialogue about the European Union in recent years. The state of the EU and the challenges have always been at the heart of uh, um, these events. And tonight we will put the spotlight on how the EU perceives the UK and the future relationship after the Brexit. Of course, the timing tonight could not have been better. And while we regret to see the UK leave, this will not mark the end of dialogue and cooperation, uh, quite the opposite, as the shape of our future relations remain um, unclear. The negotiations in Brussels and London are still pending and are going to an extra mile. We will have to increase our efforts to communicate and find common ground more than ever. And in order to build this uh, new relationship, or in other words, like uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said this weekend, it's a new beginning with old friends. So we, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, we will do our contribution to keep channels for dialogue open and provide platforms for discussions together with our partners here in the UK, especially also in Scotland. So in, sense, in this sense, um, I am looking forward to the views um, of the panels, of the panel speakers and the Q&A session with the audience later. Again, thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Mark. Thank you much indeed, Matthias, for that introduction. Again, thanks again for your support. And now if I can just go straight into uh, Giles Merritt. Giles, over to you. Uh, if you could make, if you, I think you're still on mute, by the way. Yes, how's that? Is that a good? Okay, so Europe's reaction. It seems to me that we can divide this into two. There's the man in the street reaction and there is the EU reaction. The man in the street reaction is pretty clear. It was first of all disbelief. Whatever happened to the pragmatic British? And that has turned to irritation. No question about it. A lot of people I speak to are irritated and rather cross. The EU, I think they've got over being irritated and rather cross. The focus now is Europe without Britain. What does that mean? And where does that, where does that point towards? I think it's fair to say that the, the whole messy Brexit saga has actually eclipsed the geopolitics. And the, the British government's behavior as the awkward squad with a lot of rudeness involved has actually managed to disguise how important, how muscular the British really are. And it's made us forget Britain is a member, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Europe, Britain is a nuclear power. It has the strongest military outreach, second, slightly better than France's. And of course it has enormous economic muscle, not quite as much as the Brexiteers think, but still maybe eighth or ninth by purchasing power parity. What's the bigger picture now coming into focus? Sorry, let me get rid of that. Um, the first thing I thought of, um, sorry, telephone call. The bigger picture. Well, I think the focus is now switching to, first of all, security, and secondly, financial services, because these are things that have not been properly dealt with in the Brexit negotiations. And they're what are 
worrying a lot of a lot of Europeans. The next focus, of course, is next year, the 2021 challenges. And I think there's a general view Brexit couldn't have come at a worse moment. First of all, the post-COVID economic situation. Maybe I'm a, a Jonah, but I think we're looking at a depression, not a recession. And I think depressions are potentially highly divisive in terms of how national governments respond. Then we're looking at the post-Trump mess. Afghanistan, Iran, the start of strategic nuclear uh, talks, the Middle East, a real mess, and the question of the US and China. How is that going to play out? And to what extent is Europe going to be caught in some sort of a crossfire? or forced to join one side or the other. These considerations are all raising in people's mind the question, how global is the Boris Johnson government for all the talk about global Britain? And I think the feeling is not very much. First of all, going back to the P5, the Security Council, the UK is going to be an outlier. France, also a permanent member, is going to be the spokesman there for the EU27. And then the other three members, Russia, China, United States, all pretty muscular. So Britain is going to look small and isolated, I, I fear. Then there's NATO which, uh, of course, President Macron famously described as brain dead. It's not exactly brain dead, but it is a bit educationally subnormal at the moment. Um, and I don't see any ideas coming from the British at NATO at the moment. There's climate change, of course, uh, which the British government is championing. But in my opinion, the real problem is developing countries uh, meeting the COP21 goals, not developed countries. And there, the British are leading the, uh, the move away from uh, development policy uh, by cutting the aid budget. So the overall consensus in Brussels is that as far as the UK is concerned, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. Let's look at the EU, where it is. It's a bit of a mess at the moment, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the vulnerabilities, you've got the Eurozone <laughs> and the budget. You've got the Frugal Five. You've got the Club Med, Spendthrift. You've got the Visegrad countries. And then you've got uncertainty over Angela Merkel's successor and President Macron showing at the next uh, French presidential elections, quite not that far away now. On the strong side, on the positive side for the EU, I think we should remind ourselves, <coughs> pushed by COVID, EU governments managed to almost double the budget. It may not stay double, but it, it's a significant step forward. And I think even more significant than that is the idea that the EU may sooner or later <laughs> raise its own taxes. That positive side to the EU prompts a final reflection in my view. I don't think I'm the only person in Brussels who thinks none of that None of that two trillion recovery package, none of the idea of the EU raising tax, none of that would have happened with Britain in the European Union. And it's something to reflect on. Thanks, Mark. Thank you much indeed, Giles, uh, for setting a 
bad scene uh, and the first of some very difficult questions which I suspect will not be the only difficult questions uh, uh, tonight but a very good introduction thank you very much indeed and now our next speaker uh, is Nicoletta. Nicoletta welcome. Thank you Mark and thanks to the organizers for this invitation it is a pleasure for me to be here with you tonight. So uh, <clears throat> Giles has already mentioned it. Yesterday, the latest uh, deadline of the Brexit saga has expired <laughs> without an agreement. We still have the, many, the main contested issues uh, um, not settled in terms of governance, in terms of level playing field, in terms of uh, fishing rights. The uh, Boris Johnson's mission in extremis to Brussels, to meet Ursula von der Leyen, did not succeed. And the two parties uh, uh, still are far apart in the European Commission's uh, words. Uh, I think that this uh, situation is the result of the uh, different characters of the two parties, which emerged very clearly during the negotiations and which will also impact heavily on the future relationship between the European Union and the UK. Uh, on one side, I think that the attitude of uh, Boris Johnson's government um, turned out to be deeply and clearly ideological. And this was a major obstacle to the uh, successful uh, negotiations. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think that moves such as the internal market bill, the perspective uh, finance bill, and also the refusal by the UK to include the foreign security and defense policy in the negotiation package can be explained. Because in the end, what is uh, um, at stake for the UK is the access with the zero tariff and zero quota to a market of 450 million people. Um, on the other side, the European Commission uh, took a more pragmatic approach uh, based on uh, red lines that clearly links the access to the internal market to the respect of the uh, European Union rules. And I have, I have to say that member states have been uh, remarkably cohesive in, uh, um, in their support of the European Commission and negotiating position. Now, for the future, uh, both in case of a minimum uh, deal, if we manage uh, until the end of December, or in case of a no deal, uh, which is becoming more and more uh, um, possible for the future, uh, UK will be a difficult neighbor for the uh, European Union. We can uh, expect that the UK will uh, continue to uh, reaffirm its identity and power uh, in, in, in an ideological way. This will mean that most probably the European Union should expect uh, a strategy of fiscal dumping on the side of the UK, but also probably a mercantilistic competition on strategic resources uh, such as energy, for example, and also fish, based on the UK first uh, uh, approach. London will also try, I fear, to uh, undermine the European Union cohesion in a competition uh, approach. Uh, and this can be done by London either by promoting uh, vetoes to the European integration uh, progresses by some uh, member states or by um, encouraging tolerance by some member states uh, towards the unfair behaviors by the UK, or more by encouraging opting out to the uh, EU rules uh, by some uh, member states. So it would be important on the side of the European Union to try to maintain uh, cohesion as, far, as much as possible. On foreign policy, some major um, dossiers have already been uh, mentioned by uh, Giles. I think that London and Bruxelles will basically align on some crucial issues such as climate and Iran, for example, but I cannot exclude an escalation of competition uh, between UK and EU towards Biden's uh, America. 
the ideological approach by the UK could also lead us to an ideological clash with other capitals in the EU, and uh, I think particularly about uh, Paris, uh, on the vision of sovereignty and also strategic sovereignty. And then there is the Scottish situation, uh, which I would like to mention, which could be potentially explosive in the future, especially in the case of a no deal. I can expect that, that Scotland will become more and more vocal in its, uh, claiming, uh, uh, in its claims of uh, independence. And we look at Brussels as a natural interlocutor in a, a reunification perspective for the future. So, in any case, I think that um, any deal, if, it's, if it is possible to reach any deal uh, before the end of the year, uh, will basically represent only a small part of the future relationship to be defined between uh, the UK and the EU for the next years. And uh, we cannot expect big changes, at least until 2024, when there will be the next elections, both in the UK and uh, in the European Union. In conclusion, since there will be uh, no special relationship between the UK and the EU, I fear, despite what was promised uh, in the beginning by both parties, uh, I think the European pragmatism should keep uh, a straight course both, uh, um, but, but, but at the same time, try to um, preserve the European Union cohesion by uh, defining uh, uh, the main strategic interest that will also guide the relationship between the European Union, both with the UK, but also the other partners at the international level. Uh, what I think is that the UK will uh, turn out to be a, a trouble uh, neighborhood in addition to the Mediterranean one and the Eastern one, uh, which will have to be managed by the European Commission and the European Union with all means at its disposal. And I mean uh, commercial, diplomatic and also political. Uh, I will leave to there, Mark, and I'm ready to take up any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. And now I'd like to hand over to uh, Nikolai. Yes, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody from um, Berlin. I have, um, I'm very uh, glad to be speaking here, even if it's only uh, virtually. I would have loved another opportunity to come uh, to Scotland uh, to meet you all in person, but at least one of the advantages of Zoom is that uh, we can have speakers from Brussels, Berlin, um, and Rome uh, together in such a panel. And I would like to, to speak um, for the starters um, a little bit about the perception of the UK, the Brexit negotiations so far, but also the, the issue of Scottish independence in, in Germany. And I want to start um, with giving you a few polling data from Germany, how, um, as Giles said, the man in the street uh, perceives uh, the Brexit uh, saga uh, in Germany, but also how that has reflected uh, in the thinking of uh, the German government, which most recently has been again in the spotlight of the UK press uh, in terms of the Brexit negotiations. And I think the starting point uh, that we should always reflect upon is the feeling of sadness, of loss. Uh, I think for, for the Germans, uh, the UK um, belongs to, to the core of Europe, at least in, in cultural terms. Um, before the referendum, there was um, a clear expectation that the pragmatic uh, UK would vote uh, to remain within the EU. There were press campaigns like here on the right, uh, please don't go from Der Spiegel, why Germany needs the British. Um, and there have been uh, several polls with remarkable consistency uh, about whether the Germans regret or welcome the UK's exit from the European Union. And you see here throughout these last four years an overwhelming expression of regret. Um, and even the small group of welcoming Brexit was mostly composed of AfD voters, so voters from the Alternative for Deutschland who are not sad to see the UK go, but rather were happy that somebody damaged the European Union. So I would say uh, the amount of sadness about the UK leaving uh, was even greater. So I think throughout the years, uh, you will still see a big regret in Germany. And I think for a long time, you already also saw still a hold up, the hope for a second referendum and they, that there might be a turn of event. And I think only since January, uh, since December last year with the latest election result, there has been a real acceptance of Brexit um, in, in, in Germany. 
But what the sadness didn't turn out to be or translated into uh, was a very soft negotiation position. Uh, so I think you all heard the myth of the German car makers uh, banging on the door of the chancery and causing, calling for Angela Merkel uh, for a soft negotiation position. And I think even this year, there were still rumors in the British press and when Angela Merkel would take over the, the presidency of the European Council, um, then finally she would step in and bring forward a good deal for the United Kingdom. And I think for me, it was exactly the other, the other way around. The, um, priorities of Germany in these negotiations were about safeguarding the 27 first and foremost, safeguarding uh, the integrity of the single market. And you see this here even reflected within the public where here's a comparative poll of Germany, France, Italy, and Poland, how the public perceives the negotiation position. And strikingly in Germany, you, will be have, you have the highest amount of people who think the European Union was even too soft uh, on the United Kingdom and the lowest number of people who think that the EU was too hard. And so here the, you have this expression of Germans who think that if you're in a club, you have the right to its benefits, but if you're outside of a club, you shouldn't get still beneficial access to the single market. And in terms of government, I think the best expression for me was that in 2017, even before uh, Theresa May wrote the Article 50 letter to the European Union letter, when I was sitting in internal rounds about what are the priorities of Germany in, in these Brexit negotiations. And there, even back then in early 2017, German officials said it's the integrity of the single market, it's the border in Northern Ireland, and then it's an orderly Brexit with the United Kingdom. So even as early as 2017, Germany had a very big focus of also protecting in a solidarity manner the, the interest of Ireland uh, in these negotiations. And I think this combination really shows that the German uh, government, but also the German people, despite their sadness of the UK leaving, are still thinking that this is a negotiation where the interest of the 27 should come first and foremost. And even to this day, we have Angela Merkel last week saying in the Bundestag that for Germany, we, uh, there is an interest, of course, in a trade deal with the United Kingdom. It is an important trading partner, but first and foremost, there should be uh, the defense of the single market and the integrity um, of the, of the 10, uh, 27. Which brings me to my, my third point, which how does that affect cooperation with the United Kingdom and how the UK has been perceived um, as, a, as a partner. Unfortunately, I have this, uh, this polling data here only in German, but I think it's pretty self-translatory. Uh, uh, it's a comparison how Germans view the trustworthiness of France, the United Kingdom, Russia, and the United States. And I think it, it very clearly shows that the big sort of I don't want to use the downfall, the decrease in trust in the United Kingdom as a partner did not come with Brexit itself. Uh, there was still from the German public still a continuous trust in the UK as a, as a partner, unlike very strongly uh, the, the big decrease in the trust in the United States after the election of Trump. But it only came more recently with, when Boris Johnson became prime minister. And I would say it became even, uh, even bigger, the decrease in trust with the internal market bill. Uh, for both the German public and the German government and parliamentarians, uh, they view European integration very much through the prism of law. The EU is a community of law. And this idea that you would sign a treaty and eight months later go ahead and say we are willingly violating this treaty uh, was something that even in a hard negotiation for Germans was unthinkable. And so I think this, what cannot be understated was how much damage this idea that you would willingly go ahead and break your treaty commitments there have done to the image of the United Kingdom. I would say primarily and very strongly in the German public, but also within, within the German, the German uh, government. Um, and therefore, I would say that for now, the German government has been more reluctant to cooperate with the UK, even in areas outside of the Brexit negotiations, and has been waiting for the outcome of these negotiations. If what I still hope for, we get, uh, we get a thin deal with the UK, between, uh, with the European Union, then I think in the, in the future, there will again be more scope for bilateral cooperation. 
there has been at least appreciation in by the German <laughs> government that the UK um, has in many areas where the Trump administration has devi deviated from European interests, like on the Iran negotiation, like on the Paris climate uh, agreement. There, the UK has stayed on the side of its European allies. So I think if the the toxic no deal, uh, if the toxic no deal can be avoided. Avoided, there will also be again more scope for bilateral and trilateral scope uh, for cooperation between Germany, the United Kingdom and, and possibly uh, France. But I think the big conditions for that will be an agreement between the EU and, and the UK so that uh, the relationship can be to some extent detoxified in the foreseeable future. Which brings me finally to the question that we've been posed, how Scotland and Scottish independence has been viewed uh, in Germany. I think there has been also a markedly change over the course of the last year, but I would caution no outright uh, support. And I think to maybe illustrate that, I feel copied you um, uh, a newspaper article about when Nicola Sturgeon visited Berlin and Potsdam last year, which uh, to me marked a real change in attitude in, in, in Berlin uh, to this que question of Scottish independence. In 2014, in the last Scottish independence referendum, nobody here could understand why there was even a question of independence. Uh, the UK is a democratic country. Why would you want to even think about uh, independence? And it's surely an, an internal matter of the United Kingdom, and we'll keep our hands very strongly away from that. Um, even after the Brexit referendum, when Nicola Sturgeon visited Berlin uh, shortly, in, I think in July or, or August 2016, people in Berlin were very careful not to make any public appearances with her, very clearly saying this is internal matter of the United Kingdom, we don't want to get involved um, in that. And I think over the course of the very difficult Brexit negotiations, there have been a change in attitudes towards how strong the democratic credentials of the UK are to some extent over prorogation and some of the other difficult moments of parliamentary democracy in the UK last year. And also about the difference between Scotland voting for remaining within the European Union and England and Wales voting against it. And of course, Northern Ireland voting also for remain. And so uh, last year, Nicola Sturgeon was celebrated as a committed European in, in Potsdam and people were much, much much more willing uh, to, to work with her. And I think there is now a, a greater understanding of the discussion about Scottish independence, which I think would translate to a more open ear if there is a second independence referendum, but there will certainly still not be a push from Germany or the EU as a whole uh, supporting the question before there is an agreement between uh, the Scottish government and uh, the UK government and UK parliament on whether to hear, whether to have a second referendum um, as such. So I think until this question is decided, Germany and the EU will very clearly still remain neutral on that question. Uh, but um, I want to, to sort of end uh, with the notion that there has been at least a change in perception of this question here uh, in, in Berlin um, as uh, the Brexit saga has developed uh, in uh, sort of uh, together with the changing perception of the UK as a partner overall. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Nikolai, for those comments as well. Again, taking some of the issues right back to home as well. Good, some, I'm sure, start for some of the discussion later on. And last and certainly not least, uh, so Dr. Kirsty Hughes, who is the uh, director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations, which, as I've uh, said uh, at the beginning, is one of the um, co-sponsors of this event. Can I also mention that uh, uh, today we are, or this event is associated with, uh, or marks for launch of a new paper on the issue of uh, uh, EU views of the UK and Scotland after Brexit, a uh, new paper by Kirsty Hughes, uh, uh, written by Kirsty Hughes and published jointly by her centre and, and by the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, details of that are on her website, and I'm sure they'll be on the European Movement Scotland website as well. Uh, it's been published today, so uh, particularly any journalists who are watching, uh, I'm sure you'll find some uh, interest uh, in that report as well. So welcome, Kirsty, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and good evening, everybody. And thank you to, to Mark, to the European Movement in Scotland, um, and to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for doing this event with us. And 
uh, particularly to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, as Mark's just explained, for, for supporting um, my paper on EU views of the UK and Scotland, which, um, which is indeed available on our scr.scot website. Um, I wanted to talk about, firstly, about EU views of the UK, and I was just going to make three main points about that, and then three points about EU views of Scotland and the UK's constitutional strains. Um, these draw on the paper, and what I did for the paper was I did 18 interviews, um, off the record interviews, um, across 11 member states and Brussels. So the, these were not sort of uh, what I, one, one of you, I think Giles called the man in the street or person in the street view. This, this was with experts, policy experts, think tankers, journalists, officials, one or two politicians. Um, so so when I talk about EU views for, for my presentation now, it, it's drawing on those, those off the record views. And, and of course, one of the great pluses of talking to people off the record is you do get some pretty frank views, especially at the moment when you ask people uh, in the rest of Europe, because UK is still European, it's not in the EU, but when, when you ask people what they think of the UK. Um, on the positive side, starting with a positive side, I was very struck by talking to people, and, and I had the same experience doing interviews earlier this year for another paper, was if you ask somebody in The Hague or, or in Paris or in Stockholm what they think about the UK, they tend to start with some comments on their previous relationship with the UK as an EU member state. And almost everybody has something positive to say on that. There are lots of debates within the EU. People aren't on the same side and states aren't on the same side on everything. But there's a lot of member states in the EU that will say, oh, but we used to work with the UK on trade, and the UK was a very important voice on trade. It was the, the most important voice for the non-Euro group of member states, those, those countries that still haven't joined the Euro, um, welcome from Central and East European countries, the UK's position on Russia, and, and some general welcoming um, of the fact that, that as UK was one of the, the largest member states, to some extent it could provide a balance at times to the to the power of the Franco-German relationship. The UK was seen as a country, rightly, that supported enlarging the EU, welcomed by some member states, not by other member states. It was seen as a country um, that, that whose support, for instance, in Sweden, welcomed the UK's position a lot on, on international human rights. So, so the UK, I think, was very well respected. Um, the word pragmatic has come up already in, in other panelists' contributions. It was seen as both highly professional, highly influential, and also a pragmatic country, a serious member state. So, so perhaps we're so used to looking in, in the UK at our own Eurosceptic media and our debates in this Brexit years, and, and we've lost sight of that. And I, and I think you know, it's a great pity when you hear that sort of range of points being made, if only they had perhaps been heard more strongly um, during the 2016 uh, referendum. And, and of course, everybody has moved on. And so again, if you talk to different member states, they will also talk to you about how they're now rethinking their alliances across the EU 27, who are they gonna work with more or differently now the UK has gone. So that's the positive. Um, on the negative side, to add to what some of our panelists have already said, um, you, just, you just hear people saying that they find the UK's political deterioration quite extraordinary. The word baffling came up a lot in the interviews I did. And you know, I'm talking to experts and political analysts, but at the end of the day to see the UK go in quite a, such a chaotic, um, direction. Um, the UK has lost its reputation, it's damaged its image, it's, it's obviously undermined its influence both by leaving the EU and not being in the room, but also by the way the government has behaved and, and the scenes we've seen at Westminster in the last couple of years. Many, many commented that it's become a, a figure, a, a risible figure, it provokes smirks or, or wry smiles. I, I even had a comment from from one uh, Northern European neighboring country that said, oh, oh, you know, our public do still watch it. They find it more entertaining than the crown. 
Um, now we can laugh at that, but of course it's actually, it's not, it's not very funny. And in, in other countries, people said, no, no, the public are really, they're not watching anymore. You know, there's an awful lot else going on in Europe at the moment, clearly. Um, so the UK is seen as having become unreliable, unpredictable, it's untrustworthy, the internal market bill impacts of being willing, to, as Nikolai said, to, to break an agreement and break international law has, has deeply shocked people across the EU member states. And that is going to last, I think, for quite a while into the future, certainly while this government is in power. So, that, so that's, it's maybe not surprising, but I think when you listen to that across 11 member states, it's fairly, it's fairly devastating. My third point about the UK and the maybe somewhat good news so to be taken in the context of what we've heard our three other panelists say, especially Nicoletta's rather tough take, is that EU member states want to deal. Um, and they also want in future to be able to build a more positive and constructive relationship with the UK. Very difficult to do that, obviously, if it's no deal, but even with a thin deal, there is then at least the possibility but that very much depends on the choices made by the current UK government as, as long as it's in power for the next up to the next four years. Um, the EU were disappointed at not to have more discussion about cooperating on foreign and security policy. They would like to cooperate on wider uh, international issues such as climate and human rights. Um, but I think what they're gonna be less keen to do even with a deal is to, is to immediately get into more detailed discussion of economic issues. The, the CBI in the UK has said it, it wants to campaign to push the UK government, if it gets a deal, to then negotiate more on services. Well, the EU is still not gonna be open to cherry picking as a single market, even, even with a deal. The EU has a lot of other issues on its agenda, the COVID recovery, the European Green Deal, rule of law questions, and more. So, so I think, um, I think exactly where the relationship goes next, so it significantly depends on the UK government, but it obviously it's got to be something the EU wants to do as well. And one, one last point here, I did ask in a number of the interviews, I asked people, could they imagine under a different government with a change of heart, with the UK returning to the country that people thought they knew in some way, would it be able to rejoin the EU? I, I received a mixture of responses to that, but on the whole, on the whole, people didn't want to say no, um, but they didn't see it happening for a very long time. And it will maybe be ironic to Scottish ears to hear that a number of people unprompted said they thought it would need a generation. Um, 10 years to many people seemed really rather too, too short a time to imagine. Um, of course that does, as Giles was talking about, it depends where the EU goes next if it goes into a more multi-tier multi-speed EU perhaps we can we can imagine something sooner but at the moment that that's not on track um, or not in sight let me um, I'm, I'm running out of time and I want to, to let us get to the Q&A but let me just make three quick comments about views of Scotland first of all quite a lot of sympathy quite a lot of awareness that Scotland uh, obviously voted remain in 2016 that Scotland is leaving the EU or has left the EU with the rest of the EU, UK and it didn't want to. But balancing that at the end of the day, also the comment that Scotland's not, you know, it's not very high up on people's agenda. It's probably a, maybe a certain more attention paid to it in, in Sweden or the Netherlands than in the Czech Republic. Um, it's, but it's, it's not, you know, so it's not, it may, it may look fascinating to us in Scotland um, or in the UK to look at our constitutional strains. Some people are watching that, some people are watching it very closely, um, but a lot, a lot of people aren't. So that, that, that's one point. Secondly, as, as I think Nikolai just said, um, when it comes to a possible independence referendum, um, when it comes to questions about whether the UK might fragment, on, on an independence referendum, the general view is, member states would be neutral. It may be a different sort of neutrality to the 2014 neutrality, which was a rather sympathetic view towards the UK government and the then commission president, uh, suggesting it would take a very long time for an independent Scotland to rejoin 
the EU. Um, but in, in general, EU member states have had enough instability from the UK at the moment. So you're not really, you may, you're not going to find um, many governments saying they would welcome the prospect of the UK fragmenting. I have to say, if you push that a little bit and say, but what about that scenario? And then people will generally say, well, that would be quite extraordinary because the UK is such an old, uh, well-established state and democracy. And people then start thinking about what sort of state would England and Wales be then? How would it develop? How would it fit into the European and international scene? And that's not something that in the UK and Scotland we discuss very much, obviously, because in Scotland we're, we're discussing what an independent Scotland might look like for better or worse. And, and, and that question of the England and Wales is one that does come to, into, into focus quite rapidly if you, if you talk to people in different EU member states. Finally, having said that, um, people aren't in general across the EU looking for the UK to fragment. If you say to people, but what if Scotland chooses independence? If that is legally and constitutionally sound, then you get a very pragmatic response. If Scotland has democratically voted for independence, if that's agreed between London and Edinburgh, Scotland is then a 5 million strong, it's a North European, country, it's been in the EU for 47 years, it's a democracy, it's a market economy, so it meets a lot of the Copenhagen criteria already. And so people are very aware of Spain's concerns of the Catalan situation and the precedent that sets, but if London and Edinburgh have agreed a constitutional and legal process, then my, what I hear is that the EU is going to be open to that and open to, open to a normal accession, one, one where Scotland might be expected to move rather faster than the Western Balkan candidates are at the moment. And I think, you know, one, one last comment before I stop. In Scotland, there's a lot of discussion around plan Bs or plan Bs to Z for independence referendum, what to do if London and Boris Johnson keep saying no. What I don't hear is enough discussion of how looking for other routes to have an independence referendum might impact on EU member state views. They're not just looking for a legally watertight thing. They're looking for something where, where as in 2014, this is agreed so that if Scotland voted yes, if it did, there would be recognition of that independent country from London. Without that, however fed up EU member states are with the UK and Brexit, it would be a mistake to think that therefore they're all going to abandon that future bilateral relationship with this nonetheless still important neighbour on their doorstep and, and simply back Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kirsty. Again, another excellent presentation and make sure you look at uh, Kirsty's new, new paper today. Well, Kirsty said there, not everyone throughout Europe is uh, watching this debate, but there are more than 200 people tonight who are watching this debate and many of them are uh, from outside Scotland, many across uh, elsewhere in Europe as well. So welcome. Um, and we will try and get as many questions as we can. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, as best I can groups of questions, two or three, and then I'll invite the speakers to comment if they wish on those groups of questions. So I hope we'll get through as many as we can in the next uh, about uh, 35 minutes uh, that we've got for questions and discussion. So the first question which I want to go to is one from uh, David Gao, uh, who asks, um, has the way the UK government handled the protracted talks, including the current round of breach of international law and many other things, uh, irreparably, irreparably damaged EU-UK relations with spillover for Scotland? Can I say to uh, uh, our speakers, I'm just reading out the questions direct from the Q&A, so you might want to look at the Q&A to find out. So that's a question from David Gao. But after that, there's a question from uh, uh, a number. Uh, what impact does the change from Trump to Biden have on the dynamics of a post-Brexit relationship between the UK and the EU? And is it possible to discern whether that's any relevance for independent Scotland in joining the EU? Um, and a third question of this group um, from an anonymous attendee, quite a long question, but um, the point that I think is, relates to this question is, if Scotland does vote to join the, uh, or join the EU or becomes part of the EU, but obviously the rest of the UK doesn't, um, would that then result in um, a serious impact on trade between 
Scotland and the rest of the UK because uh, Scotland to join the EU and will that also have an effect on Ireland? So it's a uh, questions about how uh, uh, the UK's behaviour during the negotiations has affected EU-UK relations, a question about the change of Trump to Biden and then the possibility of Scotland joining and all and having impact on the rest of the UK and all these then having an impact on how uh, um, uh, having potential impacts for Scotland. So three quite complex questions, but I think they all do link together. And rather than ask for um, volunteers, because I know I might volunteer to be first, I'm going to go for the order. We have questions, uh, speakers. First of all, I'll ask Giles if you could uh, try and tackle those, uh, those questions. Giles. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, the answer to David Gow's question, and I have to say, remind everybody, David is a former uh, Brussels correspondent. So uh, I expect the question to be quite sharp. Um, the answer is it, the behavior of the Boris government, Johnson government does not in people's mind mean the UK as a whole is um, on a permanent blacklist. But it does mean that for as long as the British government is dominated by Brexiteers, uh, the chances of there being a positive relationship are actually negligible. Um, and I think in, in our panel discussion, we've been talking in rather neutral terms about Britain, but in fact, it's number 10 Downing Street that we need to talk about. And as long as there is a Eurosceptic government, there will be an Anglo-sceptic Europe. Um, on the Biden-Trump thing, um, I, I think the first thing that's worth saying is just as people in Europe don't see Johnson as being Britain, I don't think they ever really saw Trump as being America. So I think the return of Joe, of a democratic government that espouses multilateralism is generally viewed as a return to normality. Um, a, a lot of fences to mend, no question about that. But basically, uh, a lot of goodwill, I think, right around the world, including in Beijing, I would suggest, um, for the new administration. And I've forgotten what the third question was, Mark. Uh, about the possible consequences of Scotland joining the EU and then having a possibly train difficulties between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and what might mine mean for Scotland and indeed also for Ireland? Uh, I'm a, the, my answer might appeal to Scots who are thought to be um, close to their money. The view around Europe, I think, is can Scotland afford to join the EU and can the EU afford to have Scotland join? Um, the, the, the general view, it may be wrong, is that the Scottish economy too tightly linked to that of the English, the British economy, um, that uh, Scotland's own natural resources, mainly oil, have been used up, frittered away by the English. Um, and that the EU, at the moment, I don't think can afford to take on um, another another sort of budgetary um, uh, responsibility. Um, so I don't think the question of Catalonia is uppermost in the European mind. I think it's a question of hard cash. Okay, thank you, Giles. Nicoletta, can I go to you? 
Yes, Mark, thanks. Um, as Kirsty was saying, uh, I was quite tough in my initial statement, but uh, um, I mean, this is due to the um, latest developments in uh, EU negotiations with the, the UK. And that's why I agree with the interpretation of the um, uh, degradating relationship between the EU and UK due to mainly the position of the Johnson's government and not in general as a negative uh, judgment on the side of the EU, of EU countries towards the UK. And I speak in particular about Italy, which traditionally was one of the countries which took a, a mild um, position regarding the uh, negotiations with the UK uh, because a number of reasons. I mean, Italy was connected to the UK for uh, um, trade and economic reasons, in, and specifically in some strategic sectors like uh, defense. Uh, a lot of Italian citizens were uh, working and living in the UK, but also in general, UK was seen as a good balance uh, within the European Union uh, to the uh, Franco-German engine uh, to which Italy somehow tried to uh, remain connected uh, over the years. So I, I mean, also on the side of Italy and in general uh, for the European Union, the uh, Brexit was uh, lived as a shock. Uh, but for the future, I think there is uh, um, a positive attitude in reconsidering the uh, position of the UK and also, uh, I mean, addressing the option of a possible future even if it's in the long term, uh, reunification of the UK to the European Union. The general perception is that UK belongs to Europe and that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it will be uh, a damage for everybody uh, to lose this kind of relationship for the future. Um, Actually, I think that both in the case of Johnson and in the case of Trump for the United States, um, the uh, general perception was the perception of an accident in, uh, uh, in the political environment and, uh, and the history of these uh, two countries. Then, I mean, from an expert point of view, uh, we understand this is not necessarily the case and there are uh, deep reasons for the uh, success of both Trump and Johnson uh, in the in the past few years, but this is just to um, to uh, underline that there is a general consensus that uh, both the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, will remain uh, key strategic partners uh, for Italy and also for the European Union as such. Uh, about the, um, uh, the trust uh, uh, in the uh, UK government, uh, I think uh, that yes, it was, uh, 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 it was uh, um, dramatically undermined by the recent choices by uh, the UK uh, and it will take time to restore uh, that trust uh, for the future. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think in Italy there is a positive perception on the um, possibility to welcome Scotland in the future as a member of the uh, European Union if, as Kirsty was underlined, all the conditions will be in place for a peaceful uh, uh, agreement between uh, Scotland and London uh, about the referendum and the uh, claims for uh, independence. This uh, will mean that um, Scotland will have to go through an accession process, which I think will be less troubled and less problematic of recent accession process that the European Union uh, lived with the neighbors, but at the same time, the uh, trade issue uh, will remain. So in, in the case uh, Scotland will uh, join the European Union, there will be also a difficult process for settling the trade relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK, which risk to become a second Brexit saga. And this is something which is watched carefully by many European countries. 
Okay, thank you much, Jaden Nicoletta. Nicola, can I turn to you? Yes, I only uh, want to add on the points that haven't been mentioned so far. So on the question on the uh, whether there has been irreparable damage to the image of the UK, I don't think that's the case in, in Germany. Um, I mean, you've seen the, uh, to be honest, quite nasty headlines in the UK press uh, and about Merkel in Germany in the last few days. Uh, and Angela Merkel was asked about them yesterday in a, in a press conference and her answer was quite cool. Uh, she said, oh, that's good to know, but I'm not negotiating at all. Uh, and thereby saying like, this doesn't touch me. I know we are in a negotiation situation where you can have nasty <laughs> rumors, but this is, let's, let's all be grown up and let's handle this, uh, this in a cool manner. And I think this is the overall attitude of the German government who doesn't want to be drawn in these kinds of fights. Um, and I don't think there has been an irreparable damage over that. I think more, more dangerous, as I said, was the attitude on the internal market bill, uh, because this really touched the fundamentals on how Germany views international relations. And this uh, idea that you could just violate your international commitments really goes counter to what you perceive uh, basically your friends and allies to do uh, in, in the question of such, such importance, especially on something where there was so much effort put into uh, finding a solution for the border in, in Northern Ireland. And therefore, I think it was an important step for the UK to agree to a settlement on the internal market bill uh, over the, the joint committee with the EU. And I think if we come over uh, this this period, if we get to a Brexit uh, deal, uh, then I think the perception will also re recover, uh, which you can already see in the perception of the United States, uh, which was heard quite strongly by the Trump presidency. And you can see now a sudden reappearance of Atlanticism in the German debate with Biden. Um, and I think this shows that the, the personal connection of many people to the United States, but also to the UK, is still quite deep. Many people have studied in the UK or lived there from, from Germany. So I think the, the sort of underlying foundation is still, still there for, for a deep uh, friendship between uh, the, the two uh, countries. Um, <clears throat> which brings me to my second point, the, the question of Biden and how that impact the Brexit negotiation. I think the impression here, as I said, in, in Berlin was that um, in many questions of tensions between Trump and the Europeans, the UK, despite Brexit, sided with the Europeans. Um, and this was already seen as one of the few positive sides in this difficult Brexit negotiations. And there is hope that Biden now makes a no deal Brexit an even more lonelier prospect to the United Kingdom. And that on the other hand, other way around, if we get to a Brexit deal, this opens the this sort of at least some window for a more uh, sort of resurgence of the West in terms of cooperation on, on climate negotiations, in terms of the Iran deal, in terms of how to deal with Russia, where there can be more cooperation between Washington, London, and the rest of the European Union. So this is rather seen as, as a positive uh, a positive uh, factor on these negotiations. Finally, on, on, on Scotland and the question of independence, much was said. Uh, I particularly want to stress Kirsty's point that from Germany's perspective, it really needs to be uh, or to be acknowledged uh, an independent Scotland. It needs to be a, um, a process that is coordinated with London um, and not against uh, against London. This, I think, would be the precondition for seeing this as an orderly uh, independence procedure. And only if that were to be the case, I think there can be then a conversation about Scottish um, uh, uh, accession to the European Union. But here, I would think that Germany, as the other Europeans, uh, would think that this has to be comp compatible with the single market. And therefore, there is a strange tension that the more hard a Brexit becomes, the more difficult it would be to integrate Scotland into the European Union because therefore the border between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom would have to be more strict uh, because it would still be the external border of the single market, um, which um, I think uh, doesn't make this discussion uh, very comfortable uh, for, for Scotland to some extent, but I think would still be uh, the um, approach from the European Union. If you think about EU membership, it would, of course, entail membership of the single market and customs union. And therefore, the, the deal with the United Kingdom would also affect how a border, uh, if it ever came to be between Scotland and the rest of the UK, would function. 
Thank you, Nikolai. And finally, again, Kirsty. Thanks, Mark. Um, just a couple of, of quick comments, because I think the questions have been answered fairly fully. Um, fo following on from what Nikolai was just saying, um, in, in the first question, uh, David Gow said, would there be a, a spillover, perhaps a positive spillover for those in Scotland who want independence from a, from a bad EU-UK relationship? And, and I would say, only up to a point. I think in his initial presentation, Nikolai said, well, people in Germany now understand more perhaps uh, some of the reasons why people in, in Scotland or, or a majority of people at the moment anyway, uh, would choose independence. Particularly when, when you go on to, to thinking about future scenarios and when you start to think about borders, then actually the more stability there is and the closer the relationship between the EU and the UK, then actually the easier it would be to then have Scotland inside the EU if, if the rest of the UK or England and Wales, given Northern Ireland special status, uh, were, were closer because it would be a, a less hard border. And if you think back to 2014, you know, the scenario of Scotland becoming independent in the EU when the rest of the UK was in the EU was, was obviously in many ways much more straightforward. So, so I think that would be one point. Very, very briefly on, on Trump to Biden, um, it goes back to the discussion we were having earlier about, you know, is the UK going to be a cooperative partner or not on foreign policy with, with the European Union? I think the Biden victory puts more pressure <laughs> on Boris Johnson, even if it's in a more ad hoc way, to work well with European allies, not only in, in NATO, but in terms of in terms of EU foreign policy. Um, and, and finally, just to say something briefly on, on the, the border issues and, and that question, and also to disagree with Giles a bit, who, who made Scotland out to be a, an economic challenge, for the EU, I, I think people have understood that, that North Soil is, is no longer no longer the answer. Um, but Scotland is, is very advanced and offers a lot in terms of renewals, renewables. Um, and also, if we look at the the uh, messy end of the EU UK talks, there's a rather fascinating aspect of a potential Scottish accession to the EU called fish, and the fact that Scotland has a great part of the UK's fishing catch landed into Scotland and fishing waters. Um, that might be a rather interesting discussion to observe in any in any future EU accession negotiations. And I, and I think it was Professor David Bell who, who suggested in, in one of his analyses that actually Scotland, if it did join, would now uh, be a net contributor to the EU budget. Um, and, you know, I talked to one or two people in Nordic countries for, for my paper who said, well, look, Scot Scotland would be, maybe it'd be a sixth Nordic state and it would be our ally. And so that could be quite positive for us. So, so you know, I mean, in the, in the EU, you always get a range of views, but certainly I heard a range of views. Um, and just to make sure I answer that question about the problem, what, what, would a, what would a hard border between Scotland and the rest of the UK do to Scottish English trade? I think then there I do agree with Giles, it's problematic. You know, there's a lot of services trade between England and Scotland and services are going to be particularly hit even if there is a deal between the EU and the UK. On the other hand, um, back in the European Union, Scotland would benefit from being part of free movement of people. Uh, it's been terribly important for the Scottish economy. I think it would be attractive to foreign direct investment. Um, and I, I'm expecting if, if there is a deal, then I, I think it's about time we saw from the, the Scottish government some serious analysis of, of what the economic pluses and minuses would be of the sort of EU-UK border we will then know is definite for the, for the immediate future. So, so the, these things are very multifaceted as always. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, thank you to the speakers for answering that round. And I say in answering those questions uh, very fully, we've also managed to answer, I think, a few more questions in our record, at least in part, but we've got time for one, maybe more rounds. And I want to now move to a different set of questions. And this time I'll start with Nicoletta, just give you advance warning, and then go for the same order. Uh, Nicolai Kirsty in the finishing with Giles when we go, go around the speakers. But a number of questions um, we've had uh, about uh, issues to do with um, the euro and finance issues. So um, 
uh, we'll try and take those together. The first one is, should a possible future independent Scotland commit to joining the euro at various opportunity? Would this help our future entry to the EU? Could the Scottish population be persuaded? Again, another question, um, well, same the question further down. Uh, is it a given that if a legally independent Scotland were to join the EU, it would be it would be forced to adopt the euro, whether straight away or in the long run. And a question which is directly related to the euro, but maybe has some overlap, which uh, uh, says uh, points out a thin deal or no deal, a current deal, if any, will create problems for financial services in the City of London. Uh, could this accelerate moves to develop further the process of banking union? in the EU. So Scotland and the Euro, number of issues about that, and what about uh, the financial services position? Will there be an acceleration of a move towards banking union in the EU? And first of all, Nicoletta, could I invite you to start off? Thanks, Mark. Uh, very interesting questions. I will be uh, quick in my answers. Um, well, uh, the possibility of Scotland joining the uh, euro, um, yes, I mean, in, in an ideal scenario uh, where Scotland is uh, independent and uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we'll have to uh, consider uh, to start uh, a negotiation process for accession. Uh, definitely the idea of adopting uh, the euro uh, by Scotland would uh, help this transition. But as we said, I mean, before that, there are the there are a number of steps and a number of issues that need to be considered to uh, convince the European Union that uh, this way could be um, non-conflictual and with the UK, with London, and also, uh, I mean, uh, not risking to undermine the internal cohesion of the European Union. Because here I'm, I can uh, foresee uh, that the biggest problem uh, would be to find a consensus among the European countries about uh, the um, path to uh, choose uh, with Scotland, with uh, some countries that would be more uh, likely to um, adopt uh, a positive uh, stance on it. Others will be much more difficult to convince for uh, uh, internal issues like the uh, Catalonia issue for Spain, or, or also for considerations linked to the relationship with the UK. So in this situation, I will see uh, um, a big fragmentation within the European Union, which could cause trouble uh, also within uh, the EU at a point in which uh, we really don't need more trouble for, uh, for, the, uh, for the European Union, since we're experiencing a very difficult period. Um, on the fact, if uh, I, I mean, a, a conflictual stance by the UK could uh, favor um, a fiscal union. Um, well, I mean, th the European Union is now taking some uh, important steps, which are uh, very much linked to the um, COVID pandemic, and uh, which resulted in the adoption of uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting in instruments within the European Union, especially in terms of uh, um, convergence and uh, a future uh, of, uh, I mean, a future union in economic and fiscal terms. Uh, we know that these uh, are very difficult topics to be addressed within the European Union, with some countries that see these uh, measures only as temporary measures to uh, react to the emergency emergency and others that would like the European Union to integrate further in this dimension. Uh, in any case, I think that if the European Union would be confronted with a, a aggressive uh, UK uh, policy, uh, this could somehow favor uh, a, um, a speed up in the, in the, um, in the path towards uh, uh, fiscal union in the EU and more concrete uh, steps uh, within the Eurozone. Thank you. Nikolai. 
Uh, thank you. Maybe to, to add two, two points. Uh, first on the currency question, this is of course, uh, as far as I can see as an outsider, one of the crucial questions around Scottish independence and was one of the, the crucial question, um, as far as I remember in the 2014 independence referendum. And I think from an EU perspective, it's clear that every new member state has to commit to joining the EU, uh, the Eurozone eventually. Um, but there is no target date um, on that. And we, are very, we very well know that there are countries like uh, the Czech Republic um, or Poland or Hungary, uh, which do have that legal commitment to on one day in the future join the Eurozone, but it's certainly not set uh, anywhere in stone that they have to do that within a certain time frame, And I would be surprised um, if all of them do within the next 10 years. Um, and so I think even for, for Scotland, um, I think if there is sort of with all the other conditions someday an accession treaty to the European Union, there would be a clause that it should eventually join the Eurozone, uh, but I don't think it is sort of a commitment to do so immediately. Uh, which um, still backs the question on what currency Scotland would use afterwards. Um, so uh, one of the conditions for joining the Eurozone is to spend two years in the European exchange rate mechanism um, at, with your own currency. Uh, so I think just keeping the British pound as there was some discussion in 2014 would also not be the solution. Uh, so I, um, I cannot answer that question as an outsider uh, for Scotland itself. I think it's a question for Scotland to answer. Uh, but I think it's still one of the complicating issue in addition to the border question for, for Scottish independence and its potential if we ever end up that point um, in, the, uh, in, in the European Union. If you can allow me one side note where I think there is a potential for an opt-out for Scotland is Schengen. Uh, there's a big understanding that Ireland has its opt-out on Schengen due to its common travel area with the United Kingdom. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we ever get to the discussion about Scottish membership of the EU, which, as I said, uh, would come only after there is a legal route to, to independence. Um, then I think there would be understanding for an opt-out on Schengen, on, on the Eurozone, as I said, it would be more an, a commitment to join someday in the future, but not, as, not necessarily um, immediately. Um, and on, on banking union fiscal integration, Nicoletta has, I think, touched the, the most important points. What I would say to be more critical of the EU, I think so far the EU has here missed an opportunity to react to Brexit. Um, I think since the uh, crisis pressure on the Eurozone has abided, somewhat since 2015, 2016, there has been less movement than would be ideal on banking union um, and fiscal integration. This comes a lot down to my country. Germany has been very reluctant uh, to move in that sphere. Um, and for me, I think, um, it, one of the few sort of silver linings this year has been a change of attitude in the German government on, on fiscal integration in the Eurozone, especially committing to the recovery fund. I think that was important for Germany to, to step over its own red lines there. And I hope uh, this can be a precursor to more movements within the next year, um, possibly after the German elections. But I think the, uh, the EU and Germany um, in particular moved too slow here uh, on Brexit and should have done more uh, on these questions since 2016. Thank you. Kirsty. Thanks, Mark. Um, ju just briefly, I think, I think on the Euro, the conversation in Scotland is, is often not um, maybe bold enough or forward looking enough. So, so the question of this often comes like, oh, do we really have to join the Euro? Um, well, you certainly have to commit to it. You're not going to get an opt out like the UK and Denmark, but if you, you were not going to meet the criteria at the start, probably either. So once you're an EU member, but you're not in the Euro, then like Sweden, you may be able to postpone it forever. But if you're joining, you've chosen to be an independent country and you've chosen presumably at that point to, to join the European Union, how central, how do you want to play that role? Do you want to be like Ireland? Ireland took a very clear decision some years back that it was going to be as core a member state in many ways as it could, and it, and it joined the Euro. Whereas if you look at Denmark and Sweden, they both play very constructive, important roles in the European Union, but nonetheless, they're, they're a little bit more on the sidelines by not being in the Euro. And I don't think Scotland 
the Scottish debate doesn't seem to be ready to think about things in, in that way. Um, and inevitably, to some extent, because Scotland have to first become an independent country, the debate therefore focuses a lot on, well, would we use the pound? Will we go for sterlingisation? When will we get to having our own Scottish currency? If we're using the pound, can we join the EU? As Nikolai says, you'll have to pretty soon have your own Scottish currency at some point to be able to meet the other criteria for, if you're not in the Euro, at least managing the exchange rate with the Euro. Um, there's a question whether you might be able to have a transition period from using the pound to using your own Scottish currency. And I, I noticed that someone was also asking about the European economic area. Obviously that includes the three EFTA countries and the 27 EU member states, and, and they would all have to agree, you'd have to meet all the single market criteria, but you wouldn't have to meet the Euro criteria. And it would be interesting to see what happened to the fish negotiations um, at that at that point. But I, I mean, what I've always said about that option is, is, you know, why would you choose that option if you're trying to take back control as an independent country? Why wouldn't you want your seat at the table um, and your vote? But just to finish, I think you know, Scotland's politics looks very different to English politics at the moment. It looks more normal and it looks more pro-European. What the EU will not be wanting is a mini UK in their midst. They won't want a country that wants various opt-outs and, and wants to be in but out. In that case, they probably would say, say to us, well, then go and join Norway in the EEA. Thank you. And Giles. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's a fascinating question. 64,000 euro question. It, it does strike me that we're discussing different ways that Scotland would be half pregnant. Well, there's no such thing as being half pregnant. And I don't think there's any such thing as Scotland being able to manage uh, EU membership in the face of London's hostility. And I think we have to square up to this. My, my own view is that maybe in five to 10 years time, the Brexiteers will have bitten the dust, that there will be a rethink in London on what sort of relationship is desirable with continental mainland Europe. And at that point, there might be a case for having Scotland really as a sort of test tube for how you get back into some sort of sensible relationship with the, the European Union. Uh, I, I feel quite strongly about the, the, what I've heard this evening. An awful lot of assumptions that next year is going to be like this year or last year. And I personally think we have to steal ourselves to a very different world. I think the whole question of debt, how we manage debt, um, the whole question about how we look at massive frictional unemployment and how to get people back to work, what to do about so many small and medium-sized companies across Europe that will have been bankrupted by the lockdowns. I think all of this is creating an extremely volatile uh, um, atmosphere for, for next year. So uh, I, I think we must all of us pinch ourselves and think our solutions to next year's problems are not the same as our solutions as we see them right now. A last thing I wanted to add about the Scottish independence or EU membership thing. I think almost always we see this discussion of the UK's fragmentation in terms of Scotland first and then Ireland. And the idea that uh, Protestant Ulster could rejoin uh, the 26 Catholic uh, counties of the Republic. 
I wonder if that's right. I wonder if we shouldn't be thinking about the way that the very volatile politics of 2021 and further on with a fervently Irish American president in the White House isn't going to accelerate cooperation within the, the island of Ireland and be a sort of bellwether for the Scots, with which conundrum I'm happy to, to step down. Thank you, Giles. Uh, and what you've done has taken us almost to a time at which you must finish anyway. But I think your uh, final questions were particularly uh, useful in uh, well, both uh, reminding us that uh, things don't always have to get better. So we'll see what happens in uh, 2021. Uh, but uh, uh, as positive as in this discussion tonight as questions as well. So thank you uh, to uh, our speakers. Uh, very much. I mean, this has been a really great discussion, I think, and uh, it's, it has really pointed us in lots of directions, um, which we want to um, sure continue to discuss some your movement in, uh, in Scotland and uh, elsewhere. Um, I want to thank Kirsty Hughes and all our speakers. I mentioned Kirsty because, as well as speaking, she also uh, arranged. I think we have a speaker as well, primarily uh, with the assistance of uh, the uh, Conrad and Adenauer Foundation. So it's been really good. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, what we try to do, European Movement of Scotland, is continue to have these discussions and these debates, not just for the fun of them, but they're very important and enjoyable and interesting, but also because we are very committed to ensuring that whatever the future constitutional arrangement Scotland. Uh, for Scotland to turn out to be. We want to be as close to Europe as we can and understanding that debate in the rest of Europe uh, is important and we uh, think uh, that, uh, uh, that we want to do it ourselves, encourage others as well to do the same. Uh, some of you may have picked up in the Q&A uh, and the contacts uh, that uh, uh, our sort of Glasgow local uh, group, uh, 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 under the beautiful name Glasgow Loves EU, has a webinar this uh, week with Cap Pascal Lamy as the uh, speaker. So you'll see information about on the Your Movement in Scotland uh, uh, website. A couple of final closing comments. Again, also to thank all our participants, uh, those who join in the debate who registered. Sorry, I couldn't take all the questions. Um, you will, at the end of this session, I hope, uh, get a screen which will show you how to join the European Movement in Scotland and get involved. There will also be a, uh, I think, screen with a survey which we're sending, which I invite you to respond to. That survey will also be in the uh, chat uh, function at the end of this uh, meeting as well. So it's now um, seven o'clock uh, here in the in GMT, uh, eight o'clock uh, in the uh, most of the rest of the uh, EU. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you for our speakers and uh, um, wish you well in whatever happens in 2021 and also wish you well for Christmas and the New Year season. Thank you much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.